So a little bit of housekeeping first, whilst um, any stragglers coming into the session come along. You'll probably see that there is a bar at the top of your Teams window. If you're not that familiar with Teams, then there are certain ways that you can interact. I think we may have the microphones and cameras enabled in some cases. Um, if you could disable at least your microphone during the presentations, and if you don't want to appear on the recording, please disable your camera as well. Um, and that way we will uh, not be recording your image. The, and the background noise won't be too high in, in case of uh, during the presentations. On the rest of the top um, bar, top left bar of your Teams, you have some icons. The participants, uh, if you click on that, you can see who else is in the meeting. Um, and if you click on the chat button, you can see who, um, you can speak to them directly or you can speak to everybody. Um, you can also ask questions if you want. And if you do have a question during the discussion, what we're likely to do is uh, use the raised hand button. So that um, comes up with the icon in the middle there. If you raise your hand, then we will come to you and uh, you can unmute and have uh, a contribution into the discussion. So we'll get started. Just in case anyone didn't see anything this morning or wasn't in a previous session, just a quick introduction to um, Local Energy Scotland and the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme. Um, we have a particular goal. We're a funded um, scheme from the Scottish Government providing advice, um, funding, um, access to technical support and various other things um, for communities and a few other organisations in Scotland to contribute to our goal, which is communities across Scotland are engaging, participating and benefiting in the energy transition to net zero. So you can see from that goal that it's actually a little bit wider than just renewable energy. But we are going to focus on this session on two aspects of renewable energy, one being um, the bottom left of uh, those four items in the right hand box, which is to contribute to Scotland's two gigawatts of locally owned generation um, and also to an extent in the top right, which is in local energy systems. So this is a uh, session which is really based on what can we do to, to continue to install renewable energy for communities um, which will be locally owned uh, across Scotland. And in some cases, they will end up being part of an energy system because that is uh, part of the new mechanism to get towards net zero. So, We'll start with very, very, very basic um, introduction as to what's going on in this in this uh, session. The words that were in the previous slide to contribute to Scotland's two gigawatt of locally owned generation target really should be followed with and to benefit as a result, because there needs to be something in it for the community organisation that's getting involved in installing renewable electricity generation. So generally speaking, and always in the past, this has been because those projects will provide a financial benefit uh, and that financial benefit can then be used to further the community's ambitions. Um, in the past with the feed-in tariff and through rocks um, there was a subsidy and these things were more common and now it's become a, mo a little bit more difficult or, or a lot more difficult um, depending on the type of technology you're looking at without the subsidy to, to get these projects off the ground. Um, in most cases, we're talking about hydroelectric generation or solar uh, PV generation or wind turbine generation on onshore wind turbine generation. Those are the three sort of mainstays of renewable electricity generation projects, certainly have been in the past, um, probably with a bias towards onshore wind and hydroelectric. Uh, but I think now that emphasis will be changing towards solar PV and perhaps uh, wind, uh, but less so on the on the hydro side, and I'll explain that in just a second. There are some opportunities, um, but it's a different set of criteria that we now look for in projects, and it's a different set of criteria that will make your project viable and give you an income. And it's those things that we want to discuss today. So hydro, um, some very happy people there at Broom Hydro. Uh, this was a, an installation supported by CARES in the past. It does, it does benefit from the feed-in tariff and uh, a very successful project as it was. However, hydro is becoming very difficult to, to make viable at the moment, primarily because the civil engineering costs that are involved in hydro haven't decreased in value to any significant extent. Um, 
whereas on some of the technologies, some of the equipment has decreased in value, the, the expertise is, is very established and uh, costs have changed. Uh, but with hydro, we find that it hasn't really yet. Um, one of the other ways to make hydro schemes viable might be to locate them next to where there's some demand so that you can uh, provide electricity directly to that demand. But with hydro, that's you don't really get that level of choice. So that, that's a very rare occasion if that was going to be the case. We do have one project that's currently looking at using some existing infrastructure, um, and that's obviously going to help. If you don't have to put in all the infrastructure, then you may you may get to a viable project. But even you know that is is, is probably more rare than even finding a demand anywhere close by. So for this session, we're not going to focus on hydroelectric opportunities. We don't see them as being um, significantly uh, prevalent just at this moment in time. Wind turbines generation, um, we'll talk about these in a little more depth, primarily from Andy Lyle. Uh, and there's a couple of illustrations here from US Wind and Garth Wind. And it's the Garth Wind side, the one on the right, uh, that is likely to be the, the sort of scale that we need to be looking at in the future. So, a key phrase for onshore wind might be go large. That's that's really what we're going to have to focus on. Uh, obviously, there's an economy of scale involved. If you can get bigger turbines in, if you can get more than one turbine in, uh, the economy of scale helps bring the costs down. And at certain scales, you can then sell your power at wholesale price and uh, the project is still viable. But they are getting to you know, tend to be quite large projects. There are some other opportunities which Andrew will go into uh, in a, a little bit later on. Um, may involve refurbished turbines, may involve extending uh, existing wind farms, uh, where there's some reuse of existing infrastructure. And those are the sort of uh, key areas that we think might have some potential with onshore wind. PV generation, the different um, scale of generation generally, just because of the, the, the nature of it. Um, a couple of examples here, there's a site, at, um, there was various sites, to be honest, in, in Edinburgh. This is, happens to be Duddington's primary school where the community organisation put the PV on the roof and sells the power directly to the school. Um, this other site that we've got illustrated here with two images at the bottom, the methyl and a ground mounted solar array is providing power into the local um, business park. The key thing about PV is that the costs have continued to decrease. You know, they were decreasing quite rapidly during the, the, the feed-in tariff um, era, let's call it that. Uh, the, and that was one of the reasons that the feed-in tariff started to, to diminish uh, quite quickly during the, during the time that it was available. Uh, they've continued to stay quite low. Um, and now more and more the module costs, the PV panels themselves, have become less, a, less of a proportion of the overall cost of the PV installation. So there will be a limit to how much they will decrease, and we're probably getting close to that um, fairly soon because it becomes then the labour, the land, the, the, the rest of the infrastructure that goes with them that, uh, that, gets, that is part, uh, a big element of the cost. But what we are seeing is that you can find a lot more sites where there is demand close by and therefore feed your electricity into that demand. And that demand then pays you a price which is generally above wholesale price. Now that whole, that difference is key to making um, solar PV projects viable. And we're seeing it on larger scales now where, where large demand pro, um, users are really sort of crying out to get that low carbon um, electricity generation. But you do have to be very close. I mean, it's really not very good if you're um, two or three fields away. You really want to be right adjacent to that to that site, so that the costs for the infrastructure of connecting the two sites together are kept as low as possible. Um, we do have a project um, in Dundee at the moment that's feeding, uh, planning to feed electricity into uh, the James Hutton Institute, um, and that's potentially going to be a two megawatt scale project, but we are seeing opportunities come in at smaller than that, um, right down to a few hundred kilowatts um, may be possible. And that's one of the things that we want to focus on today, which is the potential opportunity that we have with Scottish Water. So I, I'm just going to finish with this slide just now um, and then hand over to Julie. But the key thing for us is that 
Um, what we have with Scottish Water is a rare opportunity, and that's the, the commitment that they have for um, accessing carbon-free energy is very high at the moment, and they are very willing to work with us um, in order to achieve that. But equally, they have a very large array of assets across Scotland, and they have a very high demand for electricity. And that demand doesn't change significantly um, throughout the seasons and, and, and the year. I mean, it obviously does change, but constantly, each year on year, there is a, there's a high level of demand. So there is a real opportunity there if we can engage with Scottish water assets um, provide community energy into those assets, then the potential to increase um, the level of income to the community project and also provide carbon free electricity to Scottish water is really good. Um, we're planning on, uh, on doing this in two ways. We've had the, this opportunity available for a while, um, but uh, we almost had to wait for communities to come to us and say we think there might be an opportunity for, um, to, to build PV next to a Scottish water site. And, that, and that's sort of route one that's described on the slide there, where a community would approach us and say, how about we do a project like this? Um, now, we, we've, along with Scottish Water, found that that wasn't producing very many opportunities. So we have a second route, which we're going to uh, explore in the near future, which is where Scot Local Energy Scotland identify the sites. And then we, we find a community that wants to take those on. They'll obviously have risks in them. Um, we won't be finding a site and taking it right through to the development stage, uh, but we will try and identify sites. But local knowledge is key in, in this, and that's where I think communities um, partnering with Scottish Water have a big advantage. The, the local knowledge from the community is much better than that from, a, from an outside developer. Um, the ability for a community to approach a landowner and secure some land should be um, equally as good as a, that from a developer or better because of the, of the, the local connection. Um, and then Scottish Water taking that power um, and getting the, the, the carbon free energy um, is key for them and that's part of their, their targets. So from that introduction, I'm just going to pass on to uh, Julie McKinney from Scottish Water to confirm you know, their approach to this um, opportunity and uh, just to give you a bit more information on that. Thanks, Andrew. Just wait for my slides to go up. Yeah, so um, I work for Scottish Water in the energy team. Um, and yeah, we've been working with uh, Local Energy Scotland for the last couple of years trying to get this idea off the ground. It's a no-brainer, an absolutely brilliant idea. It's just trying to get, as Andrew says, the, the location-specific projects um, off the ground. Let me just move on, hang on up. Move on. So, um, yeah, so we are the largest uh, public sector user of electricity in Scotland, um, consuming about 445 gigawatt hours a year. Um, we're fully public sector owned um, by the Scottish Government. Um, our energy bill is uh, 65 million a year, um, only going up. And obviously, as everyone's aware, with the, the, the latest market um, impact, it's going to increase. So uh, last year, we produced our net zero route map um, and committed to being net zero by 2040, which I think is five years earlier um, than the Scottish Government. So um, I've listed the energy goals here just as an introduction um, and investing in renewables is absolutely key to us, um, you know, meeting that net zero goal. 65% um, of our carbon emissions is from electricity use and um, electricity cost itself is the third biggest cost in Scottish Water. Um, we have our own um, renewable uh, project programme um, and we've currently got about 100 sites where we've got embedded renewables, mainly PV, small number of hydro and uh, small um, turbines and a few uh, sewage fed CHP plants. So we have a range um, and a good spread of renewables portfolio at the moment on our sites and, and we're continuing to do that work to try and meet our, our goals. However, as you, as you can imagine, it's really not enough to take us anywhere near this commitment we've made. Um, currently, I think we're less than 10% self-sufficient with our power. Um, so the, really the ask um, through partners like Local Energy Scotland um, is can, can we look across the fence? Um, can we identify sites 
fully adjacent to our sites that you know would provide a bigger opportunity to um, generate more more renewable electricity on adjacent land um, and I mean this could also be council land um, so you know it's it's possible that through communities we can access council land as well because a lot of um, the, old, the Scottish water sites were formerly you know uh, council um, waste sites so um, it's a whole mix of private land um, council land that is potentially on offer um, and as Andrew was alluding to it is a complete win-win situation um, we can pay higher than market price and still achieve a saving from what we would pay our supplier for grid electricity. Um, conscious at the moment that um, the market is extremely high. Um, however, we're not going to see this probably continue um, beyond a year, hopefully after the gas supply and demand issues have, have been resolved. Um, so we're looking for a long term um, partnership and a commercial agreement with communities to pay for uh, you know power for at least 20 years onwards if you move on Iona. so um we have quite a number of resources already um local energy scotland funded a community guidance document which we've hosted on our website um about how to do business with Scottish Water, how to put together a project uh, and, a, and, a, and a business case. Um, so we have already a number of templates on offer. Um, so if any communities were interested, um, you know, we can offer our, our ready made um, power purchase agreement. Um, we have an exclusivity agreement which we can offer communities between six and 12 months so that you know um, that is sort of fixed and, and no one else is going to um, you know take over that pos uh, potential uh, project. Uh, we also have data sharing agreements that are have been worked on so in terms of the process we've mapped out in a lot of detail how we would go about this um, and with the support from Local Energy Scotland, um, we see hopefully that this is um, something that we can offer communities that, that just gives, gives you access to, to more tools and, and advice. Um, so yeah, that, that's all in place. We've also on our website got a, a map of where our existing um, renewable pro projects are, and these are Scottish uh, water funded projects. Um, in terms of our assets, I should say, you know, we have a, a large number. We've got 4,400 assets across the country. Um, we're not saying that every single one of those is relevant for private wire, um, but we have done an exercise again with Local Energy Scotland to home in on um, one assets that are of a substantial um, size that consume, you know, a sort of minimum amount of power that would be required to make these projects work. Um, and we do have some just from experience working with communities over the last couple of years and um, we've got knowledge of you know what actually does it take to work and we reckon that anything less than or more than a, a half a mile away is is probably not 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 really relevant with the cabling costs and um, there's also some rules of thumb and um, you know 300,000 kilowatt hours and above is probably something that we'd be aiming at so any assets that were below that probably um, aren't really worth looking at so we have as as we've gone through this journey the last couple of years, we've got you know we we have sort of ruled out um, a lot of things, so we're we're kind of clear on um, what type of assets would be suitable. Um, so Scotch Water, we can um, commit to providing technical resource, so um, we wouldn't expect communities to be coming in and, and testing the state of our asset or looking at any um, electrical designs. That would all be done um, by our own um, project technical. Um, colleagues uh, so anything within the Scottish water boundary we would we would provide a view as to you know what it would take to um, install uh, equipment and, and, and electrical infrastructure to develop a private wire and um, so the way that we've done these projects everything inside the Scottish water boundary fence effectively we we retain um, control of in terms of making sure it's meeting our standards and specs um, and in, then anything out with that boundary, as in the, you know, obviously the location of, of for example, the solar panels would be, be the responsibility of um, the community and, and the contractors that would be selected to do the project. And um, so that makes sense that, you know, we we, we, we retain the knowledge in, inside the boundary. Um, 
if you move on, Iona. Just as a case study, um, so we our first private wire was um, done back in 2017 in um, South Ayrshire. It was actually a farmer who was directly adjacent to Garvin uh, Wastewater Treatment Works. Um, and in this case, it was a farm um, manure um, CHP fed engine that was providing power to Scottish Water. Um, and that's been actually a really good example and a lot of our knowledge and expertise on the end-to-end -end process on how to do these projects has come from that initial uh, case study. Um, in this case, um, the plant um, is a 100 kilowatt CHP engine running on farm yard manure um, and it produces enough electricity to supply about 60% of our plant's requirements um, with a small amount of export. Um, and the way that we configure is we would, the export connection would be through the Scottish Water existing um, route to grids. So um, if there was any additional electricity that, that we we didn't uh, require or, or could consume, um, it would just be exported. Um, so it's quite it's quite a neat sort of model. It's, um, you know, the, the community's route to grid effectively is through uh, the Scottish Water assets. Um, and that PPA was signed up for 20 years um, and it's an inflated to um, an RPI index, that one. Um, so I guess just to end really my part in this, you know, we've got we've got we've got live examples, we've got knowledge of how to do it, we know what the barriers are, and um, all we're looking for really is just uh, communities to come forward um, and to talk to us um, and hopefully get some more opportunities. I think that's that's me, Andrew. That's great. Thanks very much, Julie. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll open it up to questions, and they can be specifically um, about that opportunity um, at the end. But just before that, we'll move over to uh, Andrew Lyle to give us a little bit more insight from the developer and the consultant's perspective, and uh, I would say primarily in this case the developer's perspective there through Locogen. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> Yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Andy Lyle. I'm the CEO and founder of Locogen. Um, <clears throat> we develop, build, and operate renewable energy projects. Um, but we do that where we invest in projects ourselves, um, and also we support other people to develop and build and own their own projects. We, we were heavily involved in community renewables, we have been for a very long time. Um, we've developed a, a number of the projects that were shown up earlier. Um, by Andrew and um, uh, since the end of the feed-in tariff market we've uh, explored new markets we've been uh, involved in low carbon heat and emerging technologies like energy storage and hydrogen uh, but over the last couple of years the, the, the market for developing uh, new renewable electricity generating projects has grown again quite substantially and we've been involved in developing um, a lot of new projects um, <clears throat> So what this presentation is, is, a, is a, 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 I'm sharing our strategy for development as a renewable energy developer, and I'm trying to think about how that could apply to community groups. Um, and as a bit of a spoiler alert, there's not any um, obvious major opportunities, um, but I'm just going to explore what we're doing and how it might apply and where there may be some opportunities, particularly for communities that are more experienced in developing or are already receiving benefits from other community, other other wind farms. Um, okay, so do you want to go on to the next slide, Iona, please? So I'm going to start off with uh, Greenfield Wind. Um, to agree with uh, Andrew's comment earlier that the main thing with wind is to go large. Um, <clears throat> Greenfield Wind uh, was obviously uh, very um, active, uh, both at the community scale and the large scale, while there was a subsidy. But at the end of the subsidy, that market did very much die a death. Um, uh, in the last couple of years, it has come back, uh, much much more so at the utility scale. And the reason for that is that the size of the turbines has increased substantially, whereas back in 2013, 14, and 15, we might have been looking at two to three megawatt turbines, maybe 100, 120 meters to tip. We're now looking at five, six, even larger than six megawatt machines, larger than 100, minimum 150 meters to tip height. 
some, in many cases, above 200 metres to tip height. And whilst the turbines have doubled in size uh, and output capacity, they haven't doubled in cost. So there are economies of scale. And previously, where you may have been looking at you know, 10 or 15 turbines to reach 50 megawatts, it's half that now. Um, so yeah, the, the, the economics are attractive for utility scale development. Um, the, the downside is, of course, it's extremely expensive. Um, the, the cost to develop a wind farm is, we, we, average, um, we, we estimate an average of sort of 20,000 to 40,000 a megawatt. So one to two million is the development cost only of um, a sort of 50 megawatt project. And it can quite easily be higher than that on a sensitive site. Um, it's very long time scales, like five to seven years plus. Um, and, uh, and, and it's very, very high planning risk, even with the new NPF4, National Planning Framework 4, coming out soon, which we hope, we, we understand it's going to acknowledge that the planning system is key and essential for, the, for Scotland to achieve its net zero target. So we're anticipating um, uh, that it will um, help with the consenting process. Uh, for projects that will help with the climate change targets. It doesn't mean that it's going to uh, result in consents for wind farms. They're still going to be contentious and, and challenging. Um, on the plus side, you've got uh, this NPF4. You have um, wind in the CFD for the first time in six years, which is a, an indication from the government that there's a potential that that might be the case in the future. And you've also got from SNP and from the Greens, the, um, the draft policy, paper that came out recently with a, for the first time in a long time, a, a, a target for onshore wind of between 8 and 12 gigawatts by 2020, 2030. 2030. Um, that's, a, that's an enormous target. Um, uh, so that's all very, very positive. Um, so uh, it doesn't sound like a community opportunity, but the way that we, it's not really for us either. Um, we don't have deep enough pockets to develop lots and lots of commercial scale wind farms like this. Um, and pay millions in development costs in the hope that we get a planning consent through. So the way that we've approached this is we've ch went into a joint venture with uh, um, an international company called European Energy, um, where we find sites that are potentially viable. We get the landowner's agreement signed up. We um, get a grid connection application in. We do all the initial consultation with the planners around the risks associated with the project and then present it to them. Um, so we, you know, the, the, the spend for that is tens of thousands as opposed to hundreds or millions. Um, if they like that project, they then, we then form that joint venture on that project and share ownership in it. There is no further development cost for us. We just project manage that project from then going forward and they cover all of the development costs. Um, so I was wondering whether there was something there that communities have good local contacts, they have an understanding of the local politics, they have a, a contacts with local landowners and just as, as Andrew said earlier, just as much if not a better opportunity of signing up land, could you consider a shared ownership where actually a developer takes on the majority, or all, almost all of the development costs, but you retain a minority shareholding? And when I say minority, it's not that small, it's still a, it's still a pretty reasonable shareholding. Um, the one benefit we have is we're doing a portfolio approach, so we're aiming to do lots of projects, whereas you know you might only a community might only be aiming to do one, so there may be a challenge there. But I thought that was worth raising. Um, the second one is wind farm extensions. Um, I, I, I think this is a, a reasonably good opportunity as well. So this is where there's an existing operational wind farm that's been operational for a while, um, and you're looking to extend off the side of the wind farm with a few extra turbines. Um, the, there's lots of benefits to this. Um, you, you, it, it, provided you partner with the existing wind farm owner, I think, you can share in the, the, the civil cost, the civil infrastructure that they've, they've got in place. You can share in the grid infrastructure. There's a lot of knowledge about the wind resource, which de-risks it. There's the principle of consent and planning with the existing wind farm. And if it's well designed, um, then the, the, the level, how contentious it is, and the risk in planning would be significantly lower. Um, you are probably looking at the, the much larger, newer machines, but there is the possibility of looking at smaller turbines in certain unique situations where the capex is significantly lower. Um, so this is this is one opportunity, I think, for a, for community groups where there's an existing wind farm. If you're already getting community benefit payments from it. Um, and you've got an amenable landowner or an adjacent landowner who is looking for some turbines and a, and a wind farm developer that would be interested 
um, in working with you on the, on the development that that could be an opportunity to extend and that would uh, that would offer a commercially viable uh, opportunity. Uh, you want to move on to the next one? Um, so greenfield solar again on the go large theme um, to do uh, to do this uh, you, you need to be looking at some pretty big uh, projects. This was another area that was very very active with the subsidies um, and then died a death after the subsidies. In the in the in the meantime, the cost of solar panels has continued to drop. Um, I um, it, it, it's about a fifty percent drop or more since uh, twenty. 14 or 2015, I can remember the prices of panels at that time. But the other thing that's happened as well is the panel sizes themselves have got quite substantially larger. So whereas you may have been looking at 300 watt panels previously, you're now looking at 500 watt panels um, in, the, in the solar farm, so you can fit, fit more per acre than you could previously. Um, the minimum scale now is that, that we would think is commercially viable is around about 10 megawatts. This is for a standalone situation. I'm not speaking about doing behind the meter supplying into a, an existing, this is for export to the grid on a long-term PPA or a CFD. Um, but mostly we're actually looking at larger, kind of 20 megawatts plus. Um, the benefit of it is um, it's pretty low development costs in comparison to wind. I said wind was 20 to 40,000 a megawatt. I'd say uh, solar is in the ballpark of 10,000 a megawatt and possibly even as low as five if you are going for a larger project. It's quite low development risks. The success rate in planning is quite a bit higher and there's much less um, uh, contentious points to it. And the time scales are a lot shorter, you know, two to, two to three years as opposed to a uh, sort of five to seven year process with, with wind. Um, so uh, there are areas of Scotland where solar is, is better suited. Um, I think most people probably already know this, that uh, the Angus, Fife and East Lothian and the, the east coast of the Scottish borders is the best locations from a solar resource point of view. But I am aware and, and the, of plenty of people who are developing uh, solar farms in other areas of Scotland, uh, including Aberdeenshire, right across the central belt, down through the Ayrshires and down into Dumfries. So um, there's plenty of people looking at this. Um, apart from the geographical constraint for solar resource, the other main constraint is um, the grid. You, you really do need a cheap grid connection to make uh, solar viable. Um, the, the rule of thumb most people use is 50,000 a megawatt. Um, but I think with, in certain areas of Scotland, particularly with solar resources lower, you, you need to go, you need to be cheaper than that as well. So that's the challenge is for us as a developer, it's easy and it's easy enough. Well, I wouldn't say it's easy. It's still really bloody difficult, but it's, it's for us, we're, we're going around looking for the pockets of where the grid is and then trying to find a land, a suitable piece of land near to it where we can, we can, um, get a lease agreement in place and then connect, um, and if you're looking for something in your local area, it's a little bit of potluck as to whether there's a, a, a viable grid connection um, in that area. If you do have it, though, it is, it is an attractive project. But the, the one caveat I would say is the last point I've got at the bottom on transmission network use of system charges. Um, so in, in uh, transmission connected projects in Scotland, right, well, across the UK, um, are subject to transmission network use of system charges or tenuous charges. And in Scotland, those are pretty eye-watering. Um, uh, they, they vary depending on where you are, but they essentially kill solar projects. Um, and, and what it is is that the generators in Scotland pay these transmission network use of system charges, and generators in England and Wales get paid for it. Um, it's, a, it's a legacy thing to do with um, a different market altogether, uh, 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 the expansion of gas. Um, now, you could have, at the moment, you could avoid this by looking at just distribution connected projects. However, Ofgem recently issued a minded to decision to apply transmission network charges to distribution connected projects, which would then essentially kill any project um, that's the solar project that's connected in Scotland. Um, but very recently, they did finally acknowledge that the Tenuos system is not well aligned to the net zero target and is a barrier to us achieving our net zero ambitions. Um, so there is a hope, a glimmer of hope that Ofgem might um, amend these charges in the future um, and make them more fair um, across the whole of the UK, uh, which will help encourage uh, renewable generation of well, and solar in particular. Wind can afford these, but solar in particular can't. 
Um, so it might make solar more viable. Uh, so, that, so if you are developing solar in Scotland, you do need to be aware that there is that risk. Uh, can we go back one just uh, for one bit longer? The last thing I would say, uh, though, that may avoid those charges is the co-location opportunity. If you co-locate solar with a wind farm that's already covering the Tenuos charges, then the, the marginal um, addition of the solar is, is pretty minimal. And, and, and um, if it's already paid for by the wind, then the co-location of solar doesn't have to consider too much about that. And you do get to share the, the benefit of the grid infrastructure that's already there. Uh, just due to the nature of when wind generates and when solar generates, you can actually fit quite a reasonable amount of solar onto a wind farm's grid connection without having too much curtailment. Um, uh, so for large wind farms or even for small community uh, wind projects that are already existing, it's definitely something that's worth looking at. Okay. Small scale projects. Um, in, in terms of small scale projects, uh, uh, these were viable when there was a subsidy. Uh, without a subsidy, standalone grid connected small scale projects really don't stack up. Um, the the main opportunity is that direct wire PPA one we heard about with Scottish Power. That is the, or, or another off taker, and that is really where the opportunity lies. Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity, uh, particularly if you have an off-taker that will offer a long-term PPA um, and has the financial covenant that you need to be able to secure debt. Um, the, the challenge I've found is securing the long-term PPA. Um, with businesses, um, the, where, we've, where these projects have fallen over for us in the past is they tend to renegotiate their electricity, price, their electricity contract on a three-year basis, and they tend to want to guarantee that they're going to save money on their electricity contract, which conflicts with um, a community's uh, ambition of getting a long-term PPA that you can raise debt against. So that's the challenge, I think, that you face. Um, but if you can get it and you've got an off-taker that's got a good financial covenant that the bank will lend against, that's a, that's a, th those have um, a good return and definitely worth looking at. Um, wind also has a great return when it's looked at on a direct wire PPA. Even down at the one megawatt scale that we used to do regularly, it's, it's, it's attractive. The problem is that trying to get the consent for a wind turbine in those types of environments can be extremely challenging. I called it a needle in a haystack there, but it, it almost feels like that. I've looked at so many of them and so many fail in, in planning or for technical reasons. Technical environmental issues seem to knock so many of them out. And the one final thing I would say is... Um, uh, well, not actually the second last thing I would say uh, to consider is future retail electricity prices. Uh, we know the, go the government, Scottish government as well as the UK government, have a very ambitious target to decarbonise heat. Uh, the Scottish government wants to see a million low carbon heating systems in homes uh, by 2030. Um, but they know there's only 200,000 or so homes off the gas network, which means uh, by 800 or so thousand heat pumps are going to have to be installed on the gas network. And the main barrier to that right now is the price differential between electricity and gas. So um, there is a thought that they may remove the social and environmental costs in the electricity price stack um, uh, out to try and close that price differential between electricity and gas. So that's the feed-in tariff, the, the ROCs and the CFD, and another the environmental costs that are on a per unit basis within the electricity price. Um, they may take those out, which would knock the electricity price down by about maybe 25% or so, and then the retail electricity price in, in most cases. Um, and whether they'll put that onto the gas price or whether they'll put that into a pot and pay for it separately, I'm not sure yet. Um, uh, it's not guaranteed that they're going to do this, but they're going to have to do something to incentivize the, the electrification of heat and the uptake of heat pumps. And definitely the, 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 the electricity price is a barrier to that. So one thing to consider is uh, when you're looking at your PPA um, is the sensitivity to, of your business case to a reduction in electricity prices in the future and what the terms in your PPA say is around about that. Uh, last point on there actually is um, I would see behind the meter as an initial opportunity because there are other things behind that too. There's, um, there are other technologies you could consider. A lot of businesses will, would be interested in EV charging um, and there's also energy storage. So there may be an opportunity for energy storage on site to maximize on site usage um, as well as EV charging um, uh, to consider too. So it could be a stepping stone into other alternative options later. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so the oh, back one, please. Yeah, the last one um, is repowering. I, I wouldn't say this is an immediate opportunity at all. Um, this is something that's going to grow through this decade, but everybody who owns a wind farm, an aging wind farm right now is going to be considering what's going to happen when they come towards the end of their planning life, which is usually about 25 years, and their lease, which is, is usually around about 25 to 35 years. Most uh, wind farm Owners will be looking to try and extend those and uh, get planning consents for new wind farms on those sites. So they will they will see which projects they'll be able to get the new technology on, the sort of five to six megawatt wind turbines, and get an extension to their lease. But there will and and they're likely to retain those projects if they can get those. I would imagine um, the areas where they might have issues is around where they either they can't get the extension to the lease because the landowner doesn't want to give that to them or where they can't get a, a, an increase in tip height um, in planning due to uh, maybe proximity to residential buildings because a lot of these projects that are built with much smaller turbines will were built closer to people and closer to where the grid is so there are constraints um, and I and and I know that there are a number of larger developers, particularly utilities and, and other developers that don't want to own old aging assets on their balance sheet. They may look to offload those. Um, and there's an opportunity for people to pick those sites up and repower them with smaller turbines, whether those are like EWTs um, or um, refurbished uh, machines. Uh, yeah, this, uh, the, the, there's an opportunity there. I think there's some constraints for communities and uh, around the cost of purchasing sites like that and the repowering they would need to be considered but I mean, anyway I, I don't really feel that this is an immediate opportunity but it's something that we're starting to think about um, and it's something that should maybe be considered so that's it um, the summary is that the market is challenging there aren't any silver bullets or anything that's um, it's an amazing uh, opportunity in terms of large-scale development. It all come with their challenges. With wind, it is go large or potentially consider refurbished turbines. Um, I, th I think uh, co-developing is, is an opportunity to consider whether that's extension of wind farms or whether that's um, on greenfield projects. In terms of utility-scale solar, it can be quite attractive if you can find a cheap grid. Um, but it comes with a caveat that the tenuous charges kill projects right now and you would need to develop in the knowledge that that might happen. Um, but there is some positive directions there that, that, that may mean that that market is okay in the future. The best opportunity, I think, is behind the meter solar, uh, without a doubt. Um, it has a good return, it has low risk, and, um, and it can be a stepping stone to other opportunities as well um, on, on, on sites. Uh, for local energy systems. I think that's me.